<clears throat> let's pray <clears throat> father in heaven thank you again for the opportunity and the freedoms we enjoy in our fields that are if not fast eroding it is actually gone already in some other areas but we thank you that we can continue to enjoy this privilege we thank you for the opportunity to study your eternal word and uh especially in the light of current events we pray that your spirit will illumine us so that we will uh, be prepared uh, with uh, what to expect as you have pointed out in our study already that prophecy is not intended to scare us but to prepare us so that whether regardless of our standing before you whether we are believers or unbelievers maybe some of us are not yet saved perhaps if ever there's any that we can all be prepared and so that none of us will be ashamed at your coming. Again, we pray for your spirit. We pray like David to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And we shall thank you for it. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we've covered a lot of material already uh, with regard to the second coming of Christ or uh, uh, what's coming, what we expect. So uh, we... Although we still haven't covered every area because there's a lot of detail given to us in scripture, both Old and New Testament, <clears throat> regarding details not only of his first, but also of his second coming. So we're trying to cover as much material as we can possibly can with the limited time that we have. So we've covered from the end times prior to the uh, rapture all the way how things will escalate towards the end. Uh, towards the tribulation period <clears throat> so wickedness will abound until it will find its zenith or apex at the coming of the man of sin <clears throat> so we see some of the things happening already in our day are basically a setting of the stage a dress rehearsal of what's going to happen during the tribulation period so if it's difficult already at this time then what we're going through right now is just a walk in the park compared to what people will be going through during the tribulation period. We've looked at some details of the tribulation period, the coming of the man of sin, of course, the apostasy before the rapture, and will, of course, continue until the coming of the man of sin. <clears throat> and then the, uh, uh, some details of the tribulation period, like some of the wars, including the... Uh, the uh, <clears throat> attack of uh, Russia and its allies, uh, Arab nations, uh, to attack Israel somewhere in the first half of the tribulation period because we know Israel will be living in peace during that time. <clears throat> and then somewhere in the middle of the tribulation period, as Paul, in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, there is going to be the Antichrist finally revealing his true colors. So the second half, three and a half years, is the uh, great tribulation period. We saw there's going to be another war, the Battle of Armageddon. <clears throat> we also saw the uh, <clears throat> formation of a one world religion that, was, that is headquartered in Rome, but it will have a global uh, uh, influence. And we've covered a lot of other materials. And then we went as far as the, uh, the millennial reign of Christ and then the burning of the earth, the heaven until God gives us a new heaven and a new earth. And we went back and all of that so far is what's going to what we anticipate on earth. Last week we started looking at what's going to happen to the believers after they are snatched out from this earth. So we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. But just before the judgment seat of Christ, before the day of reckoning, is the day of the reunion or the day of the rapture. Okay. <clears throat> so this is our topic for this evening. The world's problems apparently are compounding one after the other in both our local and global scenarios. And like a mother that gives birth to her child, uh, the intervals between those uh, contractions are getting shorter and shorter, see? Uh, and the shorter, the, the, shorter the, the gaps, the longer the contractions, and the longer the, until it becomes a, a one long contraction so that the mother ultimately gives birth to a baby, see? And that's what we're seeing. It seems that uh, one after the other, day after day, the contractions are getting longer and the gaps are getting shorter. So, and that's what Jesus said, just like a mother who would give her 
her baby. That's how eventually things will unfold towards the end times. There, there is a domino effect on the coronavirus outbreak, for instance. Because of the coronavirus, which we all are experiencing, tourism is, div div is diving in its deepest low. Businesses are threatening to shut down. If not, they're already shut down. Uh, the situation, the economy is expected to go down and turn at its worst. In human history, even worse than 1929. Remember 1929, uh, they had a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 what do you call this, a global economy shut down also. So they had a uh, depression, okay? a, a global depression at that time. And they were looking for some leader to come into the scene and somebody came into the scenario and that was uh, Adolf Hitler. And uh, then he was the one who brought the world into World War II in 1941 to 44. So we are seeing uh, one of the effects of the coronavirus, of course, considering China is said to be an economic powerhouse. Suddenly they have a role to play in this. Inflation is, of course, inevitable. Locust invasions in Africa, Palestine, India are beginning to get worldwide attention. Calamities such as earthquakes, floods, volcanic eruptions uh, are getting to be more and more increasing. Animal diseases, you have the African swine fever, and uh, all these others are spreading. And, of course, tensions between world powers are escalating, like... Uh, China, US, Russia coming into the scene, and of course in the South, in our area in Southeast Asia, you have uh, what's going on, tension with the uh, <clears throat> um, West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea and all of those claims there. So all of that is, that is adding to the <clears throat> tension. Plus, of course, things that are involving Israel and the Middle East. So it's almost like something has to give. We're headed to a, to a halt. Some things are undoubtedly coming to a halt, and someone and something has got to give. Okay. <clears throat> so the question: Are we at the end? All of these are predicted in Scripture, and yet the worst is yet to come. What we're seeing is not even the fulfillment of Scripture yet. It is simply the setting of the stage of the actual fulfillment. The worst is yet to come, and current events are merely setting the stage for biblical prophecy to be literally fulfilled and that will be during the tribulation period okay it's also called the time of jacob's trouble in the book of jeremiah in the book of daniel it's called the, the, the 70th week of daniel okay so <clears throat> so that's what we're beginning to see around us <clears throat> and of course what a blessing to know if you are a Christian. Aren't you glad you're a Christian in such a time as this? I mean, I cannot imagine how, how frantic a, an unbeliever can feel. No wonder a lot of people are, are wallowing in, if not dying out of depression with all that's taking place. They have no hope. This is all the heaven that they have. And if this is the kind of heaven they will have and then they have no better place to go to, then... It is not surprising that their worldview will cave into a nihilistic worldview. They will find no hope. But as believers, we have the promise of the word of God. Paul tells Tim Titus, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for, and that's what Paul was looking forward to. He was looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And Paul, the Rhine Cytus, these things speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So Paul was looking for that blessed hope. That word blessed or makaris in the Greek means happy. Okay, in spite of an ungodly world, uh, <clears throat> a, uh, we can live a happy hope in the midst of a fallen world. And again, in Ephesians 2, Paul describing unbelievers, those who are outside Christ. And he was talking to believers and they were, he was describing their condition 
prior to receiving Christ as Savior, he tells them, wherefore, remember that you being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the flesh, by that which is called the circumcision of the flesh made by hands. So circumcision of the flesh are the Jews, Gentiles are the uncircumcision, that at that time ye, the Ephesian saints, were Gentiles who got saved, that at that time, in the past, you were, notice, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now, these believers he was writing to, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh. By what? By tradition? By church membership? No, it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. So note this, those three words where we have uh, that describe the non-believer. At that time, you are without God, without Christ, and without hope, see? A person without Christ is without God, and he is no, he has no hope. That's what God's word says. Anyone you know who's not saved really has no hope. He's just putting up a facade before us, thinking that so he can just laugh away his problems on the, in this life. But he really has no eternal hope. But believers are looking for that blessed hope which is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And just to sidetrack a little bit, that very verse in Titus 2, verse 13, this is a verse that also teaches the deity of Christ. Did you notice? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of whom? Of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is one of the verses that clearly teaches the deity of Christ. Okay, Jesus is the great God and Savior. So referring to the same person, Jesus Christ, he is God and Savior. So for Greek grammarians will tell us, this is called what they call a man named Granville discovered this pattern in the Greek language. And he said, if there are two definitive articles, the definitive article, the, uh, with the end in between, if that was phrased, the great God and the Savior, that would mean two separate entities, so two separate people, the, se the great God and the Savior, referring to two different persons. But this is one definitive article, the great God and Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That means these both the descriptions refer to the same person. So this not only teaches of the blessed hope of the believer, it is one of the clearest passages to teach of the deity of Christ. So the Christian need not despair, but should be living above the depressing circumstances we live in. Why? Because God, who cannot lie, has given us, the believer, a blessed or happy hope. So, so when that moment comes, when he appears, then we would become, we would be home to be with him, our Savior forever. That's our blessed hope, the ultimate deliverance of believers out from this world, sin-cursed world. So I hope if you, you are a Christian, you're a born-again believer, that our hopes are staked on or resting on him who is the blessed hope of the Christian. So that's talking about the rapture. See, Paul in the first century, was exhorting believers of the first century to look for that blessed hope. Okay. So this is one of the passages that teach us that the, the, you know of the imminency of the Lord's coming. So we have, I'll just enumerate here in our study tonight some of the characteristics of the rapture. I already mentioned in a previous lesson that the Greek word, the word rapture, the English word rapture, is not found in the Bible. But the word rapture comes from a Latin word, rapere, and it basically means to transport a person from one place to the other. Okay? Rapere, to transport from one place to the other. So that's a Latin word, rapture. But not because the word rapture is not in the Bible means it does not true. Because the Bible talks about the rapture, the time when believers will be transported from one place, earth, to another place, which is going to be heaven. So let's, this, let's see 
some passages in scripture that describe some of the characteristics of this event, okay? Or referring to the, we have two key passages. We have actually three passages that talk plainly about the rapture, but we'll look at only two tonight. The other one is in John 14, when Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am there, you may be also. So he's talking about Christ coming to receive his own to himself. So that's a passage on the rapture. That's not a passage on the revelation or at the end of the tribulation period. Now the second passage in 1 Corinthians 15 and the third passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. So 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was writing to the believers in Corinth. And if you have some background of the believers in Corinth, they were a bunch of carnal Christians. They were saved. They were born of the Spirit of God. Jesus said some of them were, I mean, homosexuals, lesbians, thieves, extortioners, etc. Cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, 1 Corinthians 6. So this was the background of some of the Corinthian believers. But eventually they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified in Christ. So he was definitely addressing believers. And yet, sadly, these believers, instead of living and walking in the spirit, they have caved in to the pressures of the flesh. Or another word for flesh, carnal or carne. Sometimes that means meat, flesh. That's where the word carnal means. So sometimes believers can choose to live in the flesh. Now, Paul was writing to these kinds of Christians and he knew that they needed some kind of a spiritual pump and some, some uh, focus to direct their focus, not on things in this life, but on eternal treasures. So he says in chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter, in verse 51 to 54, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible must have, shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now a mystery in biblical times or in the Bible is not something spooky or something unknown. It could have been unknown in the past. In other words, it was not revealed in days of old or in the Old Testament, but it had a timing as to when it was going to be revealed. The church is a mystery, the mystery of the church. Here is the mystery of the rapture. Paul says, I show you a mystery. This is something that has not been revealed before, but is now being revealed. And you can just imagine, since this is the first time is being mentioned to the church, then these carnal Christians of Corin must have had their eyes begin to pop and say, what is this that Paul is talking about? And what is this mystery about? He says, we shall not all sleep. Now the word sleep here is of course a euphemism. Okay? It's a nice way of saying things. And the word sleep is used in different portions of scripture to refer to the believer as he dies. Okay. Lazarus was referred to being asleep. And it is only a term, a euphemism, to defer to the death of the Christian. It is never used to refer to the death of an unbeliever. As you will see any other parallel passages that talk about this. So it says, we shall not all die, the believer is referring to, or sleep. It's a euphemism. We shall, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So we've read that passage already. And another passage that corroborates this is the passage that talks about the resurrection also. Paul says to the Philippian saints, for our conduct, our manner of life, or our conversation, old English King James word, is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for, again, what did Paul say, the believers in Philippi? We're looking for the Savior. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not looking for the two witnesses. We're not looking for the battle of Armageddon. We're looking for the Savior. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change 
our vile body. So that was the hope of the believer. This is the resurrection. He will change our vile body and it, but so that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the power whereby, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So all the characteristics of the resurrected body of Christ after his resurrection, it will be that kind of serves as a pattern for our resurrected body. Christ was able to travel from heaven and back. Christ passed through walls. Remember, they were locked in the upper room and yet all of a sudden, Jesus says, peace be still. How did he get through those closed doors in the upper room? Well, with his glorified body, he was no ghost. He was not a phantom. He was literal flesh and blood, but the difference, he was in his glorified, resurrected body. Okay, so that gives us some insight on what's going to take place in the rapture. First of all, characteristic number one, the rapture is for all believers. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We show, he said, I show you a mystery. Okay, so he's addressing the believers in Corinth. So remember, these Christians in Corinth were carnal Christians. I mean, they were babes in Christ. So apparently, the rapture will include the spiritual Christian and including the carnal Christian. Of course, this is not a motivation for Christians to say, I, uh, I can stay carnal because I'll be part of the rapture anyway. But this should kind of encourage believers that the rapture uh, is imminent and therefore all the more we should be ready for his imminent return. So it's a challenge for believers to walk in the spirit. It's not an encouragement to live in the flesh. So in other words, it'll be including all believers, including spiritual and carnal Christians. Further than that, okay, there, therefore, since it'll include all believers, therefore there is no basis for a, the partial rapture theory, okay? Some uh, churches and some Bible teachers teach a partial rapture theory. In other words, those who will be raptured are only the spiritual saints. And I guess that's their way of encouraging carnal Christians to be spiritual. If you're, that's their uh, motivation. If you're not going to be spiritual, then you will be left behind. But that's not what 1 Corinthians 15 teaches. Furthermore, it says, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment. Okay, in a moment. Okay, now the interesting is that word in a moment is the Greek word atomos from the Greek word tomno. Okay, so a is a prefix meaning negative, just like a theist is a believer in God, an atheist is non believer in God. So tomno is the infinitive form of the word to cut. And therefore, with the prefix a, ah, that means no cut, okay? Or it'll be undivisible. It'll be no cut. In other words, the rapture is going to be an instantaneous event. So instantaneous, it'll be in a moment that is, it says, in the twinkling of an eye. It'll be in the smallest fraction of a second. So that you cannot even cut it any longer. So it'll be that quick. Okay, in a twinkling of an eye. So just before you blink, and then by the time you open it, it has already happened. So in the smallest fraction of a second, so small, you can no longer divide it. So that's the second characteristic of the rapture. Thirdly, that not only is it for all believers, I hope all of us here are believers. They have trusted that we have trusted in Christ as Savior. Therefore, you are part of the rapture. If that event takes place, it will be so fast like a twinkling of that, it will be a transforming event. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we will be changed from corruption to incorruption and from mortality to immortality. In other words, <clears throat> that, that, that describes two kinds of people. Okay? Corruption, in other words, that's what happens to a person when he is dead. When we die, our bodies uh, oftentimes get buried. Sometimes they're cremated. Our soul separates from the body. Our soul goes to heaven if we are Christians. Our soul goes to hell if we are not. But the bodies decay and turn from corruption. 
Okay? They get corrupted. That's why Jesus said, in, uh, rather, Genesis chapter 3 tells us of the consequence of God's curse upon man since the fall. Okay? It will be our bodies will turn back to dust. Okay? So that's corruption. But at the rapture, this corruptible body, especially the dead believers who have died, shall turn to incorruption. So Paul here is talking about the believers who have died. And if they're believers, their souls are in heaven, their bodies are in the grave, and yet their bodies are to be raised from corruption to incorruption. Secondly, there's going to be a transformation from mortality to immortality. This time, that phrase, so those words are referring to those who are alive on that event. Okay, So while we are alive, we're not yet corrupted in our bodies. That is, we're not decaying yet. Of course, we're, we're exposed to disease and everything. But we're still mortal. So believers who, are, who outlive that event will be transformed from mortality to immortality. So in other words, some believers will never die. And then Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 3. When he comes, he will change our vile body, meaning it's our body of humiliation, our lowly body. And he will transform it after his glorious and resurrected body. So such a, what a transformation. And it says in Philippians 3, it will be according to the working of his mighty power. And what does that phrase mean, according to the working? It shows the measure of power that is going to be used to transform our bodies on the day of glorification. Okay. So it's the same measure of power that God used to raise up the body of Christ from the grave. It will be the same measure of power, God's power, to raise up uh, the, corrupt, the corrupted sinner, saints rather, who are already in heaven, but their corrupted bodies will be transformed into incorruption, and our mortal bodies will be transformed to immortality. Okay, so <clears throat> it will be fashioned like unto his glorious and resurrected body. So, what a blessing that is! Maybe some of us are wrestling with what hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, cholesterol problems, uh, respiratory problems, COVID-19, name it, any sickness. When our bodies are transformed into his glorious and resurrected body, then there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more limitations of time and space, as John chapter 20, verses 17 and 19 indicate it's like the body that christ showed after his resurrection so that's characteristic number three what other characteristics do we have in scripture about the rapture well another passage first thessalonians 4 for the lord himself paul was talking to believers in thessalonica born again christians and if you look at the context there from verse 13 some of the believers in Thessalonica were sorrowful, although they were saved. They were sorrowing over the, the, uh, some of their loved ones who have died physically because they were totally unaware of what happens where with uh, their loved ones after death. So Paul, who gives this revelation, revelation to them, he says them, tells them, he tells them these things so that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Okay. Of course, we, many of us have experienced the loss of a loved one, and it is but natural for us to grieve in those times of the loss of a loved one. But it becomes twice, thrice, five times, ten times more difficult for an unbeliever because they don't know exactly where their loved one went. And they're left with speculation, they're left with tradition, they're left with superstition, as to what happens when a person dies after physical death, or what the elderly people say, uh, religious folklore, and so on and so forth. So Paul sets the record straight and tells these Thessalonian believers, 
This is what happens when a Christian brother dies. He says, he talks, he talks about when they die, that if we believe that Jesus Christ uh, raised, God raised him from the dead, then he will bring us up together with him, says 1 Thessalonians 4, from verses 13 all the way to 15. And then that's talking about physical death. When a believer dies on earth, let's say today, you and I die physically. Our soul separates from the body and the Lord accompanies our souls with him to heaven, with possibly with angels. It's like, imagine the scenario in Luke chapter 16. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and the La Lazarus both died. But Lazarus, it says, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. What a wonderful picture. That seems to indicate the picture or the scenario of every believer once he passes out from the scene. Once he expires physically, the soul is escorted by the angels all the way to heaven. The body stays in the grave. And now what happens to that body? He talks about it in 2 16 and to 18. On the day when Jesus comes, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. All right, they are already dead, but they're believers. So their souls are in heaven. Their bodies are in the graves. So the dead bodies in Christ, which are in the graves, shall rise first. Well, their souls are in heaven, okay? They shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain, in other words, if we outlive the rapture, we don't have to taste death. We shall be caught up. The word for caught up is harpazo. And that's where we get the Latin word rapere, or the transport from one place to the other. We shall be transported, caught up together with them. Who's them? Those who will rise first. And we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So uh, that's the reason why they will rise first. One preacher said the reason why the dead in Christ shall rise first, because they will come from six feet under. So they will have to rise first. And once they come out from, the, from six feet under and come out of their graves with their glorified bodies, we'll be caught up together with them, those who are alive to meet the Lord in the air. And that's when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. That's what John 14 is saying. He will come again and receive us unto himself, so that where I am there you may be also. This is spoken of by Paul to the Thessalonian saints. Remember 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. For they themselves, Paul were writing to these believers, they themselves show us what manner of entering in we, Paul and company, had unto you, and how, as a result of their preaching the gospel, ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. This is the consequence of their conversion. They served the true God and turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Living meaning contrast to the dead the gods or idols and to the true God in contrast to the counterfeits and then as a result of that they even they not only did they get converted and then they served but they also came to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come so jesus christ came to deliver us from the wrath to come so the believers in Thessalonica, we're also looking forward to that day when Christ will raise, uh, uh, well, the Christ who was raised from the dead shall deliver us from the wrath to come. <clears throat> All right, so another characteristic is going to be chronological event. Okay? So we saw it was a, for all believers, it will be instantaneous. It will be, uh, here we have, here we, it's chronological, meaning to say, there's a chronology or a sequence of events. See, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Okay? 
we shall, those who are living, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And when will this happen? It will happen at the last trump. Now, uh, here's where post-tribulationists, post-tribulationists believe that Jesus Christ is coming. The rapture will take place post, after the tribulation. Therefore, there is no distinction between the rapture and the return or revelation of Christ. Because they say the last trump, Christ is going to have come, the rapture will take place at the last trump. And they think that the last trump there is the last of the seven trumpet judgments. But I think we should probably understand that the last trump here is not referring to the last of the seven trumpet judgments. We will see in our study next week, there's a difference in the Lord's coming for his saints. First Thessalonians 4 talks about this. And the coming with his saints, which is the return. Okay? We'll look at some of those passages next week. So, so what is this last trump? So it's probably best to understand that this last trump, as the last of the two trumps or trumpets used by Israel at the Feast of Trumpets. If you remember Israel, they were a marching people going through the wilderness wanderings. And sometimes they will encamp in one place, especially in the Feast of the Trumpets, uh, to get people to round them up together. There will be two trumpet blasts that will be done. The first trump is the calling for the assembly. So, to, so that the, and this will correspond for the dead in Christ who shall rise first. And then the second and the last is for the journeying of the camp. So after the first trump is sounded, so it's to get people to assemble. And the second trumpet was intended to get them marching. Okay? It was a sing signal for the upward journey of the risen and transform saints who also shall meet the Lord in the air. That's what it corresponds to. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, fifth characteristic of the rapture, it's going to be an imminent or an any moment event. Okay, so we are not looking for any other prophetic event to take place before the rapture. It is any moment. That's why Paul said we are looking for that blessed hope. As early as the first century, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, okay? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.9 talks about God has delivered us from the wrath to come. Let me let, uh, refer you to that passage here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, okay, verse 9. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. The passage is talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is definitely coming. And yet he says, um, in the light of the day of the Lord, he says, nonetheless, he says, but God, verse 9, hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, the church is not going through a day of God's wrath. We are going to be spared from the tribulation period and even from the wrath of God in hell. In hell see? So God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation. Another passage is Romans chapter 5, verse 9. One of the results of justification by faith is much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. So that could refer to both wrath in hell or from the wrath of the day of the Lord. It seems to me from the context, Romans 5.9 is more talking about the wrath in hell. First Thessalonians 5.9 is talking about in its context, the wrath during the day of the Lord. Okay. So um, anyway, let's continue. Uh, let me see where my nose here. Keynote, okay. <clears throat> All right. So, in other words, the, the fact that the rapture 
even for first century saints was imminent and he had been promised to be delivered from the wrath to come. Therefore, the rapture is going to be pre-tribulational as Paul was looking for the savior, not the tribulation period. Okay? If Paul believed in a post-tribulational rapture or if they believed in a mid-tribulational rapture, then what would they be looking for? Perhaps they would be looking for before the rapture, well, we have to wait for the Antichrist to come. We have to wait for the battle of Gog and Magog, etc., etc. But there is no hint in these passages that they were looking for that. In fact, they were looking for the blessed hope. See, So if the first century saints looked for the tribulation period or a part of it to take place first, then that wouldn't be a blessed hope, isn't it? <laughs> So they were looking for all, oh, we have to go through the tribulation period first before we can anticipate the rapture, see. Besides, there is a pattern of God delivering his people from wrath and all because of his grace. Remember in the Old Testament, in the days of Noah and the flood, before God poured out his wrath through a worldwide deluge, what did God do? Well, Methuselah died and Enoch was raptured. Okay. And he was not, the Bible says. And then, before the flood came, God spared Noah from being drowned. So God removed Enoch already. It would be a picture of the rapture saints. And, in, and Noah would be perhaps a picture of the tribulation saints. But he was spared from that wrath. He went through it, but he was, he was kind of spared from that. In the same manner, the tribulation rapture, before the wrath of God falls on earth, God gets his people out before he pours out his wrath. Remember in the days of Lot, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? It's the same thing. See, in spite of the obstinacy, obstinacy and the hesitancy of Lot, in that very morning when the angels were telling them to get out of this place because the God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says in Genesis 19, while he, Lot, lingered. Imagine that very day when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone, Lot was still lingering. But it was God's grace that get, got him out of that place so that eventually uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. So the same day in the future when the God's wrath upon this earth will be poured out he would have snatched out his people from this earth. Okay. So those are some of the characteristics of the rapture. So let me just leave you some challenges. This being the case, and this is the next in God's timetable. It can happen anytime. It can happen even before this class is over. It can happen maybe 2000 from now. I don't know. That, that sounds a little too long, but... I mean, it's, we cannot set the date. We cannot know and we do not know the moment of that rapture. But perhaps we can sense when it is near. Jesus said, if you see the clouds darkening, you can know that somehow the rain is about to fall. Okay. So in the same manner, if you see the signs of the times, these are indicators that perhaps, although we cannot be dogmatic as to the exact timing, we know that it is near. In the light of the imminency of the Lord's rapture, what is the challenge of the rapture? So I, I got this from Harold Wilmington. He has enumerated key passages of scripture about the challenge of the rapture. First passage, he lists 10 as a matter of fact. First, uh, we are to attend the services of the Lord regularly because the word of God says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as we see the day approaching, then we should not neglect our gathering together, our assembling of ourselves together. Second, we are to observe the Lord's table with the rapture in mind. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, Paul was instructing the Corinthian believers as how to partake of the Lord's table in a worthy manner. Okay. 
Remember, he was addressing carnal Christians and their carnality surfaced by their division, backbiting, they're critical of their church leaders, even of the apostles. There was immorality and incest. There was false doctrine. And the situation was so bad that their carnality manifested even during the worship service. Even as they were partaking of the Lord's table, they were partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. Why the scenario was, people thought it was just another meal. And therefore, some well-to-do families in the church brought plenty of food. The other less fortunate didn't have anything to bring. And therefore, there was no picture of unity at all. And that's exactly what the Lord's table was intended to picture. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He is our common sustenance. So it pictures the unity that every believer has in Christ. So in the light of that, Paul says, Observe the Lord's table in mind. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? You manifest something. You declare something. You do show the Lord's death until he come okay so we are declaring something that word show means to declare something and that is we're declaring the lord's death until he comes it's a memorial service it's a memorial meal and it's a thanksgiving meal that's why the greek word eucharistia eucharist you know and when he had given thanks that's the greek word eucharistia translated thanks it's a thanksgiving meal and it's a memorial meal and we are to do this in the light of the rapture in mind. So, thirdly, we are to love believers and all men. First Thessalonians 3, 12 to 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. So to grow in love. One toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So we should be growing in love. Now, of course, there are people today who talk about falling in love. The truth is, is there such a thing as falling in love? That's the language of the world. If you fall in love, then you can fall out of love. But the Bible talks about growing in love, and that's how Christians should be doing as we continue in our growth in grace, we should be growing in our love, increasing and abounding one toward another, especially as we see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ approaching. All right. Fourth, we are to be patient. James chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Okay. So that's, that's the patience that can endure. Okay? And the only reason Christians can endure in the midst of the toughest trials, under suffering, under pressure, you can hang on and hold on under pressure. You know why? Because you and I know that we will not be under that pressure forever. That pressure is going to have its end, and that's when the Lord delivers us from all of the problems of this sin-cursed world. So that's our hope. We can hang on, and sometimes we feel we're going to cave in, but Lizette, Paul said, James says, be patient, hang on, establish your hearts. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. Okay, challenge number five. We are, we are challenged by the rapture to live a separated life. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, John writes, Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, that is, our glorified body, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, fashioned after his glorious and resurrected body. Why? For we shall see him as he is, and it says, Every man that hath this hope, in him purifies himself even as he is pure okay so every believer who greatly anticipates the imminency of the lord's return will eventually have his life pure it's the natural result 
a consequence of having that hope. So you, anybody who says, I'm living in the light of Christ's imminent return, that's why I'm doing nothing, I'm just waiting. Therefore, he is not living in the light of that hope. He is just being lazy, in other words. Okay? Sixth challenge. We are to refrain from judging others, especially judging their motives. You remember in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul was dealing with carnal Christians who were judging his motives in his ministry. And that was kind of influenced by some of the Jews who were persecuting him. And they had succeeded in influencing some believers in the first century. They were judging his motives. They were wondering, why is, why is Paul so so uh, eager and so and so uh, enthusiastic in, hunt, in, in teaching the word. And maybe he's got something uh, to gain out of this. And of course he has eternal eternity, but it's not. It, and of course the crown of the judgment seat. But Paul reminds them, listen, judge nothing before the time come until the Lord comes, who himself shall bro both bring, bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. So, I mean, we cannot read everybody's motives. We cannot read each person's hearts. What we can read is their actions. We can read is what they re read or wrote rather. We can read what they say. That, in other words, whatever's inside has already come out. But to speculate on motives, Nobody can see motives see? unless it's outwardly manifested through a statement, through a writing, or through an action. See, so Paul says, "You guys who judge me, see, let everybody realize that we are stewards of the mysteries of God, and we are doing it to be faithful to the Lord. We're not doing this for selfish gain. So stop judging us, because the Lord Himself will be the one to make manifest the counsels." of the hearts okay challenge number uh, six uh, seven rather preach the word paul charges timothy in his last inspired epistle i charge thee therefore before god and the lord jesus christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom so in the light of his appearing preach the word be instant in season or out of season, whether you feel like it or not. Whatever season you find yourself in, preach it anyway. Whether it's in the pandemic or outside the pandemic, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And why? Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And do we not live in those days? They do not endure sound doctrine. Instead, after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears they would rather listen to health and wealth gospel preachers supposedly who will tickle their ears and it's nice to hear and it it makes you feel good because it tickles your ears but they are actually turning away their ears from the truth and therefore they shall be turned and they will preach instead of truth they will turn to fables or myths as Paul tells Timothy, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. That word make full proof simply means carry it to completion. Okay. No back jobs. Finish the job, as Dr. Bob Sr. would use to say. Okay. Make full proof. Carry it to completion. Okay. Some Christians are uh, half-hearted, or some Christians are good starters. I mean, they are on fire at the initial start of their Christian life, and then they somehow wear out and burn out and therefore slow down and are unable to finish their God-given course. Paul says, listen, carry it to completion, your God-given ministry. Why? Because the Lord, that's in the light of his coming and his kingdom. Challenge number eight, uh, comfort the bereaved. Okay, that's in 1 Thessalonians 4. Talking about the rapture, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And imagine, because that is true, 
you can just imagine the comfort that brought to those believers who did not know where were our loved ones going, especially their believers. Now we know where they're going. And Paul says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Some of us may have loved ones who have passed away. A husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a child. And if they're believers or babies who have not gone the age of, of uh, accountability, then uh, it causes grief to lose a loved one, but we can find comfort in the fact that we will meet them in the air. Okay, and then, of course, we are to keep on carrying out the Great Commission, win souls. Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So they were looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And because they were looking for that mercy, so some believers, Jude says, out of genuine, authentic compassion, they made a difference by pulling people out of the fire. And that is by bringing them the gospel so that they might be pulled out from the fires of hell. And finally, lastly, we should be concerned with heavenly things. Okay? Um, Paul said, Colossians 3, if you then be risen with Christ, and that if is not a, a, an, a, a presupposition of a hypothetical presupposition. That if is actually a, uh, an assumption of fact. Okay? In other words, since this is a fact, since you have been risen with Christ, it's not if in the sense that hypothetically, but it's if in the sense that it's sure. The, since the fact remains that you have now been risen with Christ as believers. So therefore, we ought to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God we are to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because we're already spiritually dead. Dead to sin, dead to the law, dead to Satan. You are dead and your life is already hid with Christ in God positionally. That's the position of every believer. Our citizenship is already in heaven. And so that, that being the case, all of this becomes an actual reality. We are already actually in Christ, we are already dead, we are alive with him positionally, but it becomes in actuality, in terms of not just our position, but in our actual practice, is it will happen when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So while our citizenship is in heaven, but we don't live there yet, it becomes a reality when he shall appear. So while we're still living here on earth, continuing our earthly sojourn, our affection should be towards things above. So we should be doing things in this life, in time, and doing them in the light of eternity. Okay, so that's the challenge for the rapture. And uh, let me leave this time for questions. Any questions, therefore? Brother Jacob, I'm turning it over to you to moderate. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you give me a little bit uh, of the historical theology of rapture? Of what? The doctrine of rapture uh, in history uh, is not really taught in some way in the Reformation or in those uh, period of time. Is, is it uh, nearer to our time? What, what's retro? Uh, what, uh, rapture. How do you spell that? This, this, this doctrine of rapture. Oh, rapture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in the historical sense, uh, you, you have the theology on his, historical theology on it. Well, uh, the, if, if we are going to look at it as, as an expositor, mm -hmm. the imminency of the return of Christ, okay, is what is the rapture, okay? In other words, they were looking for that blessed hope. Therefore, historically, did the first century church and did the first century apostles 
look forward to the any moment return of Christ? The answer is yes. It may have not been called the rapture, but it was called the blessed hope, 1 Titus 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it was talking about the day when they will be caught up together with him. See, it was not called rapture. I'm not exactly sure, however, as to when was it called rapture, using the Latin term. There are those who argue, especially in covenant theology circles, that uh, the rapture is a more recent development. But going back, if you go use expository preaching, the first century believers believed in the any moment return of Christ. So if they believed in the any moment return, they were not looking for, like I said, the Antichrist or the building of the temple or anything that is mentioned in the tribulation period. They were looking for that blessed hope. So based on the exposition of the text and its context, you will see that these believers in the first century were looking exactly for that. They were not looking for anything else to follow or at least to be something, some event to be fulfilled before the rapture. So the other common uh, things which uh, many people talk about is when there's a rapture, there'll be a lot of people that, that will go missing. So Exactly. Yeah, so then the world will become actually, for a period of time, uh, confused. Uh, there'll be, uh, for example, many things will happen because of... Definitely. In other words, imagine uh, people will be gone, okay? So uh, just in a, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the first century, he talks about that. So your neighbor will be gone, and hopefully you will be one of them be gone, because if you're, gone, if you're not, then you've been left behind. That means you're not a believer, see? Maybe some people... Um, if it's true that babies, before they reach the age of accountability, are God's children, as indicated in Matthew 19, allow little children to come to me, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Therefore, can you imagine the nurseries and the hospitals will be, will be uh, empty? So the hospitals will be frantic. Where did these babies go? Uh, maybe some who are driving uh, will be raptured. So you can just imagine every possible scenario when instantaneously somebody will be snatched out. It's just like the same words of Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not. Just like that. He was not. So that's exactly how it's going to happen at the rapture. Yes, I uh, understand. Why those left behind? Or is the question here? Why, why those who have not raptured? They will not repent when they know that the others are wretched. Uh, uh, why those left behind? Is that did not turn to God and repent? You know, John chapter 3 says the reason why people don't repent is because they love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. See? Hmm. So when a person loves darkness... When the light of the gospel is exposed to his, to his heart, so it exposes his, his guilt. It exposes the filth in his heart. There are only two possible or three possible reactions to that. First reaction is he will try to put off that light so that he stays comfortable in the darkness of his sin. The other possible reaction is he will stay away, uh, move away from the light bearer so he can continue to stay in further darkness. Okay? Some people will go as far as, of, if this person keeps on bringing me the gospel and therefore it exposes my sin, then I will try to put off the light better. So that's martyrdom. They kill the, the, the person who brings them the gospel. But the best option is once their sins are exposed by the light of the gospel is, the, is to repent of that sin. Okay, They see the filth in their hearts through the light of the gospel as illumined by the Holy Spirit. And therefore they find that there is a place where these sins can be washed away permanently. And that's washed by the blood of Christ. If they will repent of their sin and trust in Christ as Savior. Why they don't do it? Because they love darkness rather than light. So that's why Paul said we can only plant, we can only water, 
but it is God who gives the increase. We cannot coerce people to receiving Christ. No. We don't resort to coercion. Maybe Islamic religion, Muslims resort to coercion to coerce people into their religion. But Christians do not use coercion. We use persuasion. We plant the gospel seed. We explain the gospel so that their hearts may, might be illumined by the Spirit of God. And they will be brought under conviction. And that conviction should bring them to repentance and conversion. But some people go as far as getting to be convicted. I know of some people who are convinced of the gospel message. They know it's the only way out, the only way of escape. But they go fall short of simply being convinced. They do not go further and make one more step in being converted. It is not enough to be convinced. We have to be converted by crossing the line, putting our faith in Christ alone as Savior. That's when conversion takes place. Do you think we could see the events happening on earth after we have raptured? Uh, in other words, when we're raptured, of course, we will be facing the judgment seat of Christ while things unfold here on earth. Can we watch while maybe it's not in my term to be a judge, so I'll be watching what's happening in, on earth? Well, I can only guess, but I cannot say this is a passage in scripture that tells us that this is exactly what's going to happen. I think we will be all the more concerned about the turnout of the judgment seat of Christ. Right after the rapture will be the judgment seat. And like we saw last week, each and every one of us, no proxies, every one of us will give an account. And that's a scary thought. That's why Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So, so he doesn't have to wait for that day. He is motivated to preach the gospel, persuade people to escape judgment while he knows there's coming a judgment. So it's not the quantity of our work that will be judged. It's not how many. It's the quality of our work, how, what sort it is. And I think that's what we'll, that will be our primary concern right after the rapture. It's going to be a grand reunion of saints. But then right after is a great reckoning. Okay? So that's when we'll be held accountable. So to see how God's word are fulfilled during that time. Okay, so that, that kind of answers the question. Uh, if we can, then perhaps, you know, there's a way of looking out down from heaven and see, oh, so that's, there's the Antichrist taking place. But what we're... I think we will be more focused on oh, what am I going to do if I'm not prepared when, if the judgment seat is, if the judgment is passed. At the judgment seat of Christ, will we still be judged on those sins that we have confessed? No. Okay. It has been placed under the blood of Christ. So, and like the Psalms 103 says, uh, our, our sins have been washed away and have been separated from us as far as the east is from the west. That's a wonderful passage. As far as the east is from the west, you know. Why? Because the east and the west never meet. The north and the south, sometimes they can, you know. In other words, you start here and by the time at the end, it's, it's, you go back to the north, okay. If you start from the north, go back around the earth, you're back to the north. Unlike when you from east to west, if you're in the east and you go the, to the west, when you get to the west, then the east is on the other side, see? So they never meet, see? So all of our sins have been judged as far as, uh, for, judged for the penalty of our sin. That is why it's going to be a judgment only for believers. Every one of us at the judgment seat of Christ will not be judged for the penalty of our sin. We have all been pa passed that judgment. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I send you, he that uh, heareth my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. He shall not come into condemnation, but he is passed. He has crossed the line. He has passed from death unto life. So we have all been passed the judgment for the penalty of our sin but will be judged regarding the how we how faithful have we been as a steward of our god-given time talents treasure and of the truth of the word of god see and faithfulness will be the criteria 
So why do we still have to need to give an account? Because exactly, uh, it says in Second Corinthians five, uh, we will be judged according to what we have done, whether it be good or bad. And those who did good, remember the fire will be lit. It will be tested of what sort it is. Like I said earlier, it's the quality of our work, not the quantity of our work that will matter before God. So what kind of work? So if the work is tested by fire, that's when you will know the quality of it. If it's like wood, hay, stubble, therefore it's poor quality, it'll be burned. And if it gets burns, it, if it if it gets burned, what it says in First Corinthians three, you will suffer loss, loss of gaining a crown. You don't get a crown. But if your work can be compared to uh, gold, silver, and precious stones, in other words, the quality of your work is tested, and it's tested by fire, and the quality shows it it surfaces, then you will receive a crown. All what, of us what, will be there. What, the what judgment seat will go to heaven. Go yeah, ahead. Sorry, excuse me. What I know is that the judgment seat of Christ is to give rewards. Uh, it is more of a rewarding and uh, of the works that they have done, whether they receive uh, what kind of rewards. Uh. Correct. In other words, yeah, but the, it says in First Corinthians 3, but those who... Uh, whose works are tested and they are burned, they will suffer loss. So there's going to be a time for, uh, there'll be a time for some shame there. Mm -hmm. Like 1 John 2.28 says, remember I quoted that verse last week. You may want to check it out. 1 John 2.28, John says, little children abide in him so that when he shall appear, you shall not be ashamed before him at his coming. So implied there that some of us will be ashamed. It's, the purpose is not to shame us, of course. The judge is not there to shame us, but we will be ashamed for our lack of faithfulness. But all of us will be saved. All of us will enter heaven. Some of us will be saved, yet so as by fire. So those people will be saved but they will suffer the loss of gaining a crown. Okay, in that parable, where the faithful ones with more talents given, God said that more will be given to him. Yes. To a much is given, much is required. Does that mean he will give it, be given more responsibility during Christ's reign? Yeah. In other words, that's why we said, I used the illustration last week, if you are an eight-cylinder Christian then God's God, that's a God-given gift. You got eight cylinders. God certainly expects you to run on all eight. If you're running on four, when you have eight cylinders, then God is not pleased. Uh, you're, you're, you're shortchanging God. You have been given much, much is required. But if you are a four-cylinder Christian, God does not expect you to run on eight. Otherwise, you'll burn out. So each one of us have been given gifts and talents, resources of time, talents, and treasures, and even of the truth of the word of God, and how faithful have we been in using that, see? My 24 hours is just as long as anybody else's. Therefore, I cannot say, oh, God did not give me enough time to do everything God wants me to do. No, all of us have been given enough time. It's just that that's why Ephesians 5 says we are to what? Redeem the time knowing that the days are evil. We need to buy out time. In other words, make the most out of every moment that we have in time so that it'll be spent for eternity. So the, so question, I, here, the question here is that if you are faithful for the talents that God has given you, what, what he's asking is that if uh, on the day of, uh, will the Lord give you to rule over like 10 cities, 5 cities, you know? So yeah, exactly. A correlation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that correlates. That's what we kind of hinted on that last week, that at the millennium, perhaps that's where some of us will be enjoying bigger responsibilities for the faithful. If you've been given, let's say, three gifts, but you've been faithful with those three gifts, then God will reward you with more crowns. And not only crowns, but also at the, at the millennium, there will be more responsibilities entrusted because we shall be ruling and reign with Christ uh, uh, during the millennium. But a person who has so many gifts and talents and yet he 
did not even use a single one of them, or maybe used one, and he said, I'm going to be saved anyway. I'm just going to wait for the Lord's return. Therefore, as far as that parable is concerned, therefore, that person eventually, he, I mean, if he's genuinely saved, then he will use it, whatever he has. But he, he, he may have been half-hearted or lazy, so he will be given, he will lose, lose the possibility of gaining a crown. So the fact is that whatever we do here on earth as impacted, will be impacted in heaven. Definitely. That's why I said last week, whether we like it or realize it or not, we are building something. And that building will be tested by fire. So I may not be aware of it. I may not like it or not. But since the day I got saved, God has entrusted me and endowed me with spiritual gifts. There's no such thing as a giftless Christian. Every Christian is at least one gift. Some of them, some of us are multiple gifted and God expects us to use all of those gifts and resources to edify the body of Christ. Therefore, that's what we should be doing. And whatever we do here in time will have repercussions in eternity. So I, I, I will encourage all of us to have this heavily minded to think that whatever we do uh, is actually a preparation for our future in heaven. And we are living a heavenly life here on earth. Yeah, exactly. That's what Colossians 3 was saying, as we quoted earlier, right? Set your affections on things above, even while we're on earth. See, our, our citizenship is, is in heaven. Our, we should be piling up treasures in heaven. Set our affections on things above rather than things on this life. So that when he shall appear, eventually, you know, we will enjoy him. And eventually we'll be... Uh, you know, accept, uh, be well accepted by him. There's a question, is it right to say that once we are raptured, we would be impervious to attacks from Satan? As I understand, Satan is still roaming when the rapture occurs. You are right, okay? But Satan will be roaming around on earth, okay? So while the saints will be raptured in heaven. So it says in First Thessalonians 4, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise, but then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay. So we will be forever with Christ right after the rapture. Of course, there's going to be the judgment seat, but after the judgment seat, then all of the Revelations 21, towards the end of the uh, millennium, the Bible says, God shall wipe away all our tears from our eyes. Where will these tears come from? Perhaps some of them will be because, you know, at the great white throne judgment, people will be judged at the end of the millennium. And some of them we will see there are our unsaved loved ones who will be cast in the lake of fire. Okay. Perhaps some of those tears will be believers who will feel, I should have done better when I was on earth. Therefore, I could have given more glory to Christ by giving crowns before his feet. So maybe those are some of the tears of shame for believers. But God will wipe away all of those tears from our eyes, Revelation 21, verse 4. And then we will ever be with the Lord. We don't have to be, we will no longer be bothered by Satan. No. However, uh, during the tribulation period, so we'll be ruling and reign with Christ on earth. While we are secure in Christ, we have glorified bodies, and therefore, as, as glorified men and women, we will no longer cave in to the flesh. We don't have a sinful nature any longer. The only ones who have a sinful nature are those tribulation saints who survive the tribulation period. They've never been raptured. They've never had a glorified body. So they will enter the millennium. And these are saints who will enter the millennium still in their mortal corruptible bodies. They can bear children still. And when they bear children, those children will have a sinful nature still. And this is where Satan will work and use the, the uh, unbelievers, uh, sinners who were born out of tribulation saints, and Satan will work during that time. We know that he's going to be defeated and believers will no longer be, will, will no longer somehow have any propensity towards uh, the, towards temptation or sin. Is there Old Testament scripture support for the rapture? The, like we said, 1 Corinthians 15, 
Paul says, I show you a mystery. So the rapture is a mystery, meaning to say it is something that has not been revealed in the Old Testament, but has now been revealed in the New Testament. The church is a mystery. It was not revealed in the Old Testament, but it was only revealed in the New Testament, Ephesians 3. But even though it was only explicitly revealed in the New Testament, there are pictures of it in the Old Testament. Like we said, when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, before the, it fell, his judgment fell, God took out a lot, okay, out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's nothing there about the rapture, but it seems to picture that before God poured out his wrath, he spared his own from the wrath to come. When God poured out his wrath upon the world through a worldwide flood, as a worldwide judgment, God not only removed Enoch, he also protected Noah and his family. So God, like 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and Romans 5.9, Paul writes, God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, So there is no specific passage in the Old Testament regarding the rapture because it's a New Testament mystery. I mean, a mystery in the Old Testament, but it's revealed in the New Testament. Enoch and Elijah were taken up to heaven where their mortal body changed into immortal bodies. Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, it's just like... If you and I went to the moon or to Mars, there's no way our bodies can cope with the environment in outer space. That's why people wear space suits. Now, it'll be the same in heaven, okay? Our bodies will have to be transformed. And the Bible says it was the same of Enoch. He was not, for God took him. Elijah was taken. Uh, through the chariots of fire, and then he was taken into heaven. That is why in the book of Revelation, there are two witnesses who will be preaching the gospel. And while it is not specific, it's mentioned in Revelation 11, while it is not specifically mentioned as to what their names were or are, it does indicate or give us hint as to what they did. And in Revelation 11, it talks about one who uh, eventually sent uh, what judgment like like the uh, like the plagues. Mm. So that's a hint that makes us think maybe that's Moses. And remember, they never saw Moses' body. Okay, but some say maybe it's Enoch and Elijah. But the other one is definitely Elijah because Malachi Malachi uh, prophesies about Elijah, who was a picture who was pictured by John the Baptist. And Revelation 11 pictures that the other witness is one who uh, eventually uh, sent fire from heaven or something to that effect, like, just like Elijah did at that time. So, <clears throat> so yes, Enoch and Elijah was transformed with an immortal uh, and incorruptible body eventually.